When thinking about intellectual property, it's important to think about not only how it protects the interests of owners of IP, but how it protects the interests of the public in being able to access and make use of information that is protected under various IP regimes. It is sometimes tempting to think about intellectual property in the really strong, absolutist terms that Blackstone described property, as the sole and despotic dominion of the property owner. This can lead us to think, for example, the creators, inventors and trademark owners should be able to control all or nearly all uses of their works. But this way of thinking ignores the extent to which property rights have always been curtailed to ensure that they're developed and granted only in the public interest. So even when we think about property in terms of a natural rights philosophy, it's important to remember that there are always strong limitations on the extent to which creators are entitled to appropriate resources from the commons. Importantly, they must leave enough and as good for future creators, and the public has an inherent right to access and to use new information. So we start to see why intellectual property rights need to be balanced. When they are too strong, we start to harm the commons for future creators and start to limit the ability of the public to get access to the materials they need to learn and to live their lives. All creative activity builds on the past. This means that if intellectual property rights are not balanced, that is to say, they are granted too easily, they last too long, or they are too strong in their enforcement, then we create a situation where it becomes too difficult for creators, inventors, and general members of the public to access the information that they need to live their lives. In economic terms, the efficient price of an intellectual good is the marginal cost of distribution. For, in, for digital goods, this essentially means that the efficient competitive price is very close to zero. Intellectual property provides a way for producers and distributors to raise the price above the marginal cost and therefore recoup their costs of investment. The IP system enables producers to pursue a profit maximizing strategy and set the price of intellectual property goods at the rate that will net them the highest returns for their investment. Necessarily, however, this means the people who are not willing or not able to pay the monopoly price miss out on access to the good. This is what economists call deadweight loss. This inefficient loss is particularly pronounced when the cost of providing those people with access is relatively low, especially, for example, in the case of pharmaceuticals or digital downloads of information. So in real human terms, the cost of an intellectual property regime is that people who are not able to pay that monopoly price, particularly for example if they are in developing countries, miss out on access to vital medicines and information that could improve their lives. In cultural terms, it means that access to information that is needed to create new culture, new works, becomes expensive and sometimes prohibitive. It means that access to vital knowledge educational resources and research is denied to people who cannot afford it. And unfortunately, many of the burdens imposed by lack of accessibility in an intellectual property regime fall on those who are most disadvantaged in our societies. This has led to the emergence of an important struggle at both national and international levels, where advocates for an expanded public domain from both developing and developed countries have begun to argue that the international intellectual property regime is too strong. This is particularly difficult, however, because individual countries have very little control about how they set the bounds of their intellectual property regimes. Minimum standards for intellectual property protection are set at the international level by a series of overlapping instruments. The most notable of these is the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, or TRIPS, which is required for full membership at the WTO. These standards are then reinforced or increased by an international web of bilateral and multilateral agreements, particularly trade agreements, that include minimum standards for intellectual property protection. These agreements are particularly promulgated by countries like the United States of America with high exports in intellectual property. 
So Australia, for example, in signing up to the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, bound itself to a TRIPS Plus standard in line with America's IP system. So the biggest debates in international intellectual property at the moment revolve around the expansion of this international regime through the creation of new multilateral and bilateral agreements that lock states in to certain standards of intellectual property protection.